there's a very interesting distinction that Descartes makes <clears throat> a little further on in uh, part four on page 21 between moral assurance on the one hand and metaphysical certitude on the other. He writes, for although one might have a moral assurance about these things, which is such that it seems one cannot doubt them without being extravagant, still, when it is a question of metaphysical certitude, it seems unreasonable for anyone to deny, to deny that there is not a sufficient basis for one's being completely assured about them. That's a very interesting uh, thing to say. Um, and moral assurance does not, has nothing to do with morality. Moral, moral assurance, uh, moral in the sense of having to do with action and having to do with practicality. Having a moral assurance means that one feels sure in acting on the basis of something. And the, the, the belief that he's referring to is the belief that the things which appear to us in our ordinary experience, the appearances of of uh, <clears throat> Sextus Empiricus, who keeps coming up here, I think, as a reference, that these things are real, that they're independent of us, that they are not mere appearances that we have as inward subjective experiences, but they proceed from some things that are independent of us, that are substances in that sense, things that have objective independent existence. We have a moral assurance of that, is that we act on that. I mean, if you... Uh, Cross the street when the light turns green. You have a moral assurance that uh, you have the right of way. Uh, but do you have a metaphysical certitude? Well, that's something different. The metaphysical certitude about the appearances would be a metaphysical belief, justified belief, that indeed our subjective experiences put us in touch with things uh, that are real, real in the sense that they are real and independent of us and our subjective inward experiences. That would be a metaphysical claim because, of course, as we, again, I think skepticism taught us, we, we know nothing of the sort, you know. I mean, we, we can't experience our own experience of the world in that respect. We can't view and judge it from some kind of external perspective. So any belief about it would be metaphysical in the sense that it would transcend our, the ordinary limits of our experience. Of course, that metaphysical certitude is exactly what Descartes wants. Descartes has doubted everything, and what he wants to get back to is the, 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 the native instinctive belief that we inhabit a world that is real, but with some assurance, with some reason, with metaphysical certitude. How is he going to get there? And I think that to understand what he's doing in terms of his proofs for the existence of God and his concern with God uh, in part four, uh, you have to see how that supposedly the existence of God gets him that metaphysical certitude or at least something like it. Uh, immediately in part four, after establishing that he is the thinking thing, remember, first he establishes the I think, therefore I am, then he establishes that he is essentially a thinking being, a thinking substance. Immediately he goes on to prove the existence of God, and that is a very, his argument is very reminiscent of medieval arguments, as something, some kind of connection with Anselm's argument. His argument seems to be an argument that, uh, of having to do with uh, perfection. He has this idea of perfection, he has this idea, if he looks inside his repertoire of internal ideas, he has an idea of a perfect being, an idea of God. And I, I take his argument basically to be that that idea of a perfect being could not have come from himself, that is, could not come from Descartes himself, because he recognizes as a, as a doubter, as one who knows that he doesn't know, that he himself is imperfect. So the idea of perfection, the idea of a perfect being, must have proceeded from something outside of himself, from a perfect being, and therefore, that implicates the existence of, of, of that being, which is the first thing that he is able to say exists beyond himself, God. So that's why he'll say that, you know, not only is the, the soul more knowable than material things, and so is the existence of God more knowable than material things. It's simpler. Um, and there is some reference here, or some, uh, I guess, some, some things that are reminiscent of, of Anselm. 
Um, you know, he says you can think of a triangle. And your thought will be true in the sense that you are thinking of something that is a, a true concept or true within a concept. But thinking of a triangle in general does not implicate the existence of any particular triangle. There may be that there are no triangles outside of your concept. Uh, he, he then says that because of the peculiar nature of God, the particular nature of God as the perfect being, that can't be true of God. And now we're back in Anselm's territory. That is, that if we can think of God as a perfect being, and existence as being a kind of perfection, then that perfect being must also contain the existence of or the perfection of existence, the attribute of existence, and therefore must exist. Uh, but you look those things over for yourself. I guess what I'm more interested in, uh, apart from the validity of his proofs of the ex proof of the existence of God, is rather what that does for him, because it does get us to that. You know, we have this uh, moral certainty that the things around us in the world are real. That is, they have, an they have an existence independent of us. But we have no metaphysical certitude of it. We have no absolute philosophical basis for that claim. And so, what does that have to do with the existence of God? Well, he says, uh, towards the bottom of page 21, uh, for how does one know that the thoughts that come to us in dreams are any more false than the others? given that they're often no less vivid and explicit. And even if the best minds study this as much as they please, I do not believe they can give reasons sufficient to remove this doubt unless they presuppose the existence of God. How does the existence of God help us to gain metaphysical certitude in, in this way? He continues, for first of all, even what I have already taken for a rule, namely that the things we very clearly and very distinctly conceive are all true, is assured only for the reason that God is or exists, and that he is a perfect being, and that all that is in us comes from him. It follows from this that our ideas or notions, being real things and coming from God, cannot, in all that is clear and distinct in them, be anything but true. Thus, if we quite often have ideas that contain some falsity, this can only be the case with respect to things that have come, that have something confused or obscure about them, because in this respect they participate in nothing. That is, they are thus confused in us only because we are not perfect. And it is evident that it is no less a contradiction that falsity or imperfection as such proceeds from God than that truth or perfection proceeds from nothing. But if we did not know that all, all that is real and true in us comes from a perfect and infinite being, however clear and distinct our ideas were, we would have no reason that assured us that they had the perfection of being true. So what is he saying there? Well, uh, maybe a, a lot. But that uh, if we were just ourselves alone in the universe, and um, we had our normal experiences of clarity and distinction, given that we are imperfect beings, uh, we could never be sure that those clear and distinct impressions or those clear and distinct ideas were really true, because maybe our notions of clarity and distinction are, are flawed as well as we're flawed. But if what is real and true in us comes from God, comes from a perfect being, then maybe we can have more faith, more assurance that our basic capacities as cognitive, reasoning beings are more sound than they otherwise would be were this were we not to believe that we were dependent upon this God and that our faculties of knowing and reasoning came from God as well. Um, and he continues, but once the knowledge of God and the soul has thus made us certain of this rule, it is very easy to know that the dreams we imagine while asleep ought in no way to make us doubt the truth of the thoughts we have while awake. For if it did happen, even while asleep, that one had a very distinct idea, as for example, if a geometer found some new demonstration, one's being asleep would not prevent its being true, because the, we're not making any claims about existence. We're, we're making uh, purely uh, claims about the relations of ideas when we do geometry. And as to the most common error of our dreams, which consists in the fact that they represent to us various objects in the same way as our external senses do, it doesn't matter that it gives us occasion to question the truth of such ideas, since they can also deceive us quite often without our being asleep, such as when those with jaundice see everything as yellow, or when the stars or other very distant bodies appear to us much smaller than they are. Part of 
the one of the modes of skepticism, the argument from conditions and circumstances, right? The world appears differently to people in different conditions. For finally, whether awake or asleep, we should never allow ourselves to be persuaded except by the evidence of our reason. And it is to be observed that I say of our reason and not of our imag imagination or of our senses. Even though we may, even though we see the sun very clearly, we should not on that account judge that it is only as large as we see it. And we can well imagine distinctly the head of a lion grafted onto the body of a goat without having to conclude for that reason that there is a chimera in the world. For reason does not at all dictate to us that we, what we thus see or imagine is true. But it does dictate to us that all our ideas or notions must have some foundation of truth, for it would not be possible that God, who is all perfect and all truthful, would have put them in us without that. Isn't he ultimately relying on the idea that we can trust our reason, at least, not in every particular case, but in general, because they have been put, our faculty of, of uh, reason and finding truth has been put into us by God by a perfect being. But it does dictate to us that all our ideas or notions must have some foundation of truth for it would not be possible that God, who is all perfect and all truthful, would have put them in us without that. And because our reasonings are never so evident nor so complete while we are asleep as they are while we are awake, even though our imaginings while we are asleep are sometimes just as vivid and explicit as those we have while we are awake, or even more so, Reason also dictates to us that our thoughts can all be true, since we are not all perfect. What truth there is in them must infallibly be encountered in those we have when we are awake, rather than those we have in our dream. Reason dictates that, in general, we will find truth more readily when we are awake than when we are asleep. That's a, that, that is a judgment of reason, not something that would be immediately known through the senses or the imagination when we're dreaming. But why should we listen to reason? Because it was put into us by God. And uh, it would be unimaginable that a good, a benevolent, omniscient, all-perfect God would somehow put something in us that led us to such egregious, grotesque, and drastic mistakes like while we think that there's an external world, we, we have every urge to believe in an external world, but there is no external world. I, I think that that's what he means when he says that there's just no way that you can have a metaphysical certitude about the reality of nature, of the surrounding universe, that, that your imagination, your ideas apply to something beyond yourself, unless you uh, have, unless God exists. Because if God didn't exist, then that faculty of reason could be anything. But if it comes and is put in us by an all-perfect, benevolent God, then we can trust it in general, not in any particular case, right? This is not a criterion of truth in the sense that it will allow us to sort out particular truths, the true from the false. It, it is uh, something that uh, guarantees the basic soundness of our reasoning faculty. Of course, the criterion is clarity and distinctness. And, um, you know, the idea here is that, that that will be generally sound, generally reliable, but only if our basic faculties are generally sound and reliable. So let's move on to part, parts five and part six, which is a kind of a mopping up. Part four is where the big action is.